even if you ask central bankers, how is QE supposed to work? What is the theory behind this? They won't say money printing because they know you or I or no, we can't get our hands on bank reserves. We are not banks. We're not part of the banking system. So it's not like I can go into the grocery store and hand over a bunch of bank reserves and walk out with groceries. So they aren't even money on a technical level, on, an, on a real economy level. They're only for use in the banking channel. So if you actually ask a central banker and if they're actually honest with you and say, well, how does this QE stuff supposed to work? They will never say it's money printing because they know it's not. In fact, the, the very first quantitative easing in March of 2001, Bank of Japan, there was one sole dissenter. Her name was Aiko Shinotsuka. She said, why are we doing this quantitative easing? Because we don't know how to do quantity money. We can't define it. What we do is these bank reserves and therefore we can't tease any, we can't predict any correlation between the level of bank reserves and what happens in the real economy because it's all sort of mushy. It's all psychology. So if you ask a central banker and they're honest with you, well, how is this QE stuff supposed to work? There's three theoretical channels. The first one is interest rate effect. And that's supposedly, you know, the supply and demand, the Fed buys bonds or the Bank of Japan buys bonds. And if the Bank of Japan or the Fed is buying government bonds, the, the interest rate's supposed to fall because there's more buyers for those bonds. And what you'll find out there is, no, it doesn't work that way either. Uh, even the most charitable studies find a very negligible impact on, on interest rates because the market is already buying those bonds. And though the central banks come in and buy after the market already has. So the market sets the interest rate and the Fed tries to take credit for it. So the interest rate channel not, doesn't really work. The second channel is uh, portfolio effects. And portfolio effects is, as I said, QE is nothing more than an asset swap. So the central bank comes in and says, I'm going to pay you a little bit extra for that government bond you have in your portfolio. I'm going to give you bank reserves. Now you have fewer earning assets than you had before. We expect that you're going to go out and buy some riskier assets. So by, may take, by, by, by the central bank taking the uh, risky or riskless bond off your hands, you're going to go out in the economy and lend, or you're going to at least buy a corporate bond or some other risky asset, and that's going to help the economy. But what ends up happening, again, uniformly across every jurisdiction where quantitative easing happens, commercial banks sell their government bonds to central banks, and they go out in the market and buy more government bonds. So that essentially the shell game where government bonds transit through commercial banking portfolio, dealer portfolios onto the central bank por uh, balance sheet, and nothing ever happens for there. So, the, so there is no portfolio effect, no portfolio rebalancing because of the quantitative easing. The third effect or the third channel, third theoretical channel is simply sentiment. It is the idea that if you believe the central bank is an all powerful institution and it is doing something, you don't really know what it is, but it's doing something. It sounds really complicated. It sounds like they know what they're doing. Then you're going to act as if the central bank is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is accommodative. So if you hear all across CNBC and Bloomberg and the financial media and everybody tells you this quantitative easing stuff is pouring trillions of dollars in the real economy, none of which is true. If you hear that over and over again and you alter your behavior as if that is true, then theoretically it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe the Fed is printing money, then you'll act as if the Fed is printing money by protecting yourself from the money that was never printed. And some of the ways that you do that is you buy real estate, you buy commodities, you buy cryptocurrencies, and you buy stocks. So there is a sentimental effect from quantitative easing. As you said, Adam, there's a very good correlation. It's a loose one, but it's a pretty good correlation. But it's not between the actual bank reserves. It's between announcements of quantitative easing. There is a psychological effect, especially in the stock market, but in other asset classes too. And you think about why that is. Because every portfolio and fund manager in existence has gone through mainstream education where they're told this Federal Reserve is a central bank. Don't fight the Fed. You go work at one of these portfolio or go work for one of these funds or whatever. And you, the message is reinforced all, all over the place. And let's let's also face up to the fact that most portfolio managers get paid when stocks go up. They want to own stocks right. because their clients are happy. Fees get bigger. Uh, everybody seems to be making a lot of money. And if the Fed provides you with a sentimental excuse for why you're owning stock or why you're buying stock, even if your clients are calling you and saying, why are we buying stocks? And you can say, well, the Fed's printing money. Jay Powell is supporting market. Don't fight the Fed. There's a sentimental effect. It's not a direct monetary effect because there is none. There is no way for bank reserves to get into the stock market, yet 
you see these two correlations because that's the only channel and only in financial markets where quantitative easing has any detectable impact. So the three theoretical channels don't include money printing. And in the real economy, there is no, there's no correlation whatsoever. It's really only the financial economy where you see that effect. And it's really only in sentiment. Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is, in many ways, the Fed's most powerful weapon in its arsenal is its job owning, is <laughs> just driving sentiment. It's it's actually the media. As long as the and look, it, it's understandable why the media would would behave and, and continue to believe as it does. Because, I mean, if you're a reporter at a mainstream outlet, you know these are complicated topics where you believe the experts all know what they're talking about. Right. So you're not going to just you, who are you going to ask for questions about how do you break down these complicated issues? You're going to go run into the central bank. But as, as uh, Ben Bernanke reiterated just a couple of weeks ago from his first blog post after he left the Fed at Brookings in 2015, he said monetary policy is 98 percent talk. And it is. It's, it's monetary policy is getting people to believe the Fed is this all powerful monetary institution. But as I said, if you look through its history, you look at how these things actually work. Again, go back to Paul Volcker, 1979. Everybody's got that all wrong. The Fed is not a money printer. The, the, tr the truth of the matter is the Fed couldn't even define money for you, let alone measure it, let alone manipulate it. That's the real issue here. And that's really kind of what I do with Eurodollar University and the Eurodollar study is put all these things together and realizing the fact that a very, very long time ago, the banking system and the monetary system and even the forms of money that used inside of it have evolved so drastically that left central bankers and Federal Reserve and everybody, uh, regulators, they left them all in the dust. And so all they have left is this possibility, this, 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 this attempt to manipulate psychology into doing some of the, some of these things that they can't do otherwise as a real central bank would. I don't know if this is apocryphal or true, but uh, the Wizard of Oz, apparently Frank Baum wrote it as sort of a, you know, a treatise on monetary history with the, the yellow brick road being gold. And I think the ruby slippers were originally silver slippers. Silver, yeah. But but the, the basically you're saying the Fed is sort of the great and powerful Oz, which is yep. command you know convincing everybody that that he's omnipotent yet he's just a guy behind the curtain you know who really doesn't have any powers at the end of the day. And that's how you explain how you can get Japan doing 20 years of quantitative easing, which we're told over and over again the most powerful monetary policy ever conceived. Think about QQE in Japan in 2013, the biggest, most ridiculous, most powerful uh, money printing, whatever, and nothing happened. They're still doing QQE almost a decade later. If it's the most powerful money printing that's ever been conceived by humans, how can it take more than a decade to achieve its goals? It, it, you're, it, you're, it's the Wizard of Oz. It's, it's the floating head with all the flames and everything else. And the fact that nobody knows the history of money, nobody knows the history of banking. We've all been we've all been fooled into believing the Fed is this omniscient, omnipotent institution, the ideal technocratic uh, effort. And it goes back into Greenspan, the Great Moderation. A lot of mistakes about that, but essentially we've we've. We've allowed ourselves to believe in the myth because for a long time there, it seemed like the myth was at least plausible. But then you run into something like 2007 and 2008, which was a real monetary crisis that the Fed was powerless to do anything about because of course it was. It doesn't do money. All it could do is jawbone against the, you know, this, this, the biggest crisis in the last four generations. So of course, it, it, we ended up with some of the worst consequences from it. It's really that simple. The central banks don't do money. And in lieu of being able to do money, they have to try to manipulate people's behavior as if they were. And the sad thing is you don't have to take my word for it. They admit this freely, not in public, but in some of their uh, private discussions, though occasionally in public, you look think of some of the speeches Alan Greenspan made, in particular in the 1990s. He said, we don't do money. We wouldn't even know where to start. And so we kind of moved the federal funds rate around a little bit and hope that people believe that we're doing what we're doing and that ends up having the results that we want. And through the 1980s, 90s, and the middle 2000s, it kind of looked like that was the case, but it never really was. And so they've kind of led, they've, they've been riding the coattails of the great moderation all this time to essentially beef up this myth about this all-powerful institution. And then when you get to 2007, 2008, it all just falls apart and there's no way to get Humpty Dumpty back together again. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full video it's from by clicking here.